Good morning. So in this video, we're just going to look at the human circulatory system. Now, there's a few parts of this. There is blood. There is the circulatory system itself. And that can be split up into two parts. So the blood vessels. And also, oops, pardon me. And also the heart. And then the last part is basically about a healthy heart. So it's all to do with exercise and disease. Okay, so getting into this then, just thought I'd show you some interesting pictures and things. So firstly, this is the world's largest heart. It's so big, it needs this big boy with his happy face to use a forklift to lift it. And this is a whale's heart. It's not crazy. Mm -hmm. The next little part then is, this is sort of basically talking about what the point of the circulatory system is. So every cell in your body needs nutrients and oxygen, and these come from the blood. So this here shows the blood vessels in somebody's hand. This shows all the blood vessels in their head and the blood supply to their brain, which is in here. It's pretty crazy. And the reason why there's so many blood vessels is because basically every cell in your body needs a constant supply of glucose and oxygen and if they don't get them they can actually die within a few minutes and that's basically what happens in a heart attack and stroke and that's why that can be so dangerous as well as that your heart needs to constantly beat so because of that it needs a constant supply of oxygen so here we see basically a heart which has had all the living tissue removed its blood vessels were filled up with this sort of plasticky substance and then all the tissues were dissolved and were left with it, just this, which shows all the blood vessels. So these vessels we can see here are the coronary arteries. And this big bad boy here is the aorta coming straight out of the top of it. And then there's different branches. So one goes to one of your arms. This one goes to your head. And this one goes to your other arm. And then this bad boy down here will go to the rest of the body, to your legs, and also your abdomen. Pretty cool, eh? Now, looking at the first wee part of this, the first wee part is all about blood. Okay, so this is sort of just showing you, I think, yeah, probably everyone's seen this picture before, but this basically shows you what blood is made up of. So if you look at this part over here, 55% of your blood is made up of plasma, 1% of it is made up of leukocytes, which is a fancy name for white blood cells, and platelets, which are involved with clotting. And the other 45% is the erythrocytes, or what they're more commonly known as is red blood cells. Now, we need to look at each one in turn. So the first one we're going to look at is red blood cells here. Okay, now, these are little red blood cells. They sort of, this is pretty taken with a light microscope okay so it allows us to see the blood just really really easily what we can see here is a couple of little red blood cells this yellowy stuff which is sort of filling up all this area is the plasma which is basically just the liquid part of the blood and these wee purpley bits they're really small they're just platelets so looking at this then we sort of saw some red blood cells here. We're just gonna say what their main job is. So their main job is to transport oxygen around the body. Now, to do that, they need to be highly specialized or highly adapted for that job, okay? So they need to be good at that job. Now, here's the main ways that they're adapted. Firstly, they contain hemoglobin, which is rich in iron, and that carries the oxygen. When oxygen combines to the hemoglobin, it is known as oxyhemoglobin. Hemoglobin is a pigment which gives blood its red colour. Now, what actually happens then is, so when this red blood cell would be in the lungs, what would happen is, well, I'll show you. So this is in the lungs. This is a little alveolus, 
And outside that, we'd have a little capillary where the little red blood cells will go in and move along. So what happens is you breathe in, the oxygen from the air comes into your alveolus, and then it diffuses from an area of high concentration, which is in the alveolus, to low concentration, which is in the blood. And then the oxygen basically joins on to the hemoglobin and forms oxyhemoglobin. The red blood cells then carries the oxyhemoglobin around the body in the blood. The next way that they're adapted is that they have a biconcave shape. Now, you've probably heard this before, but you can basically have two different types of shapes. Well, you can have lots more than that, but in this context, you can have concave or convex. Now, concave is like that. It's sort of like a cave, which is why it's called that, whereas convex would be something bending like that. Now, because red blood cells are biconcave, it basically means that they have two concave shapes. So if you were to look at a red blood cell sideways, like chop it in half and put it upright, it would look like that. So there is one concave area and there's the second concave area. Now the main point of that is that it provides a larger surface area for the maximum diffusion of oxygen. Now, that allows red blood cells to carry much more oxygen than if they were that shape. They've also got no nucleus, and they've got no nucleus because it means that they've got more space to carry hemoglobin. Now, the only thing red blood cells do is carry hemoglobin around, or carry oxygen around the body, so they don't need any other fancy features or things in their cells like mitochondria or nucleus or anything. They just need loads of hemoglobin. So that's red blood cells. Their main job is to transport oxygen around the body. The next one then is white blood cells. Now white blood cells are in your body to help fight diseases and infections. Now you might remember from the immunity topic that there was two types of white blood cells. There was lymphocytes, which produce chemicals called antibodies, and there was phagocytes, which engulf and digest microbes in a process called phagocytosis. So, what we said was there's two types of white blood cells, the lymphocytes and the phagocytes. Now, let's look at each one. So, the first one's the lymphocytes. Now, we looked at this in immunity. What we said was that lymphocytes usually have this large nucleus, and their main job is to produce antibodies. So when we looked at antibodies and lymphocytes, here's what happens. We said that when a microbe gets into your body, the lymphocyte will recognize the microbe. And the reason it will recognize the microbe is because the microbes have these little proteins on their surface called antigens. When the lymphocyte comes into contact with those, they'll start to produce antibodies which are also going to have a matching shape to the antigens. The antigens and the antibodies can link together because they've got a complementary shape. And once they link together, it immobilizes the microbe and makes it really easy for the phagocytes to de destroy them. If we're looking at this purely from a blood point of view, what we're looking for with the lymphocytes is a large nucleus. So basically a big cell with a big nucleus filling it up. And this is what we can see here. So here we've got a blood smear, where we've got a red blood cell, we've got plasma, we've got platelets, and here we have two lymphocytes. And their main job is to produce the antibodies, which join up with the antigens on invading microbes. Here we can actually see a load more red blood cells. So here we've got one red blood cell, and there's loads and loads and loads. So all of these here are red blood cells. We've also got a lymphocyte here. And next to it, we've got a phagocyte. Now you'll notice here the difference is the lymphocyte has a very big nucleus, whereas the phagocyte has 
what is known as a lobed nucleus. So these areas here are basically lobes. So we say it's got a lobe nucleus, which basically just means it's separated out into little blobs. As well as that, we've got plasma and we've got platelets down here. Now, again here, we can see another smear. We can see loads of red blood cells, loads of plasma, loads of platelets down here. And then down here, we've got a lymphocyte with its giant nucleus. And we've got here phagocytes with their lobed nucleus. Now, just talking about phagocytes, as we said, they've got a lobed nucleus. Their main job is to surround, engulf, and digest microbes using enzymes. And just to finish off this section then, platelets are involved in blood clotting. So what we're saying here is that they're cell fragments. So that's what a platelet is. It is a cell fragment which work by triggering the conversion of a soluble plasma protein called fibrinogen into an insoluble protein called fibrin. The threads of fibrin form a meshwork across the damaged area and as the red blood cells get caught in it, the blood clots. Clotting and scab formation reduces blood loss and helps prevent the entry of microorganisms. This is basically an electron microscope image of a scab. Blah. Oh my god. So what we're seeing here is these little fibres is the insoluble fibrin. Now it's actually really important that we recognise that one of them, the fibrinogen, is soluble and the fibres are insoluble. And the reason for that is we want the fibrinogen to be soluble, so we want it to be able to travel around your body in your blood. But when it gets exposed and it wants to form a scab, it has to be insoluble so that it won't get washed away. So it's quite a complex process. But as I say, this is basically an electron microscope of a scab where we've got the mesh, which is fibrin, and we've got the red blood cells, which are trapped in it, which is basically why scabs look really dark. Now, if you look at this, this shows a damaged blood vessel. So what's happening is the blood's flowing this way, but when it's going along, the platelets which are here will go to the site of the wound and the fibrin, the fibrinogen, which is in the blood, will go to the wound, get converted to fibrin and form this mesh. And it'll basically stop you bleeding to death. And it will also stop any nasty microbes getting in and causing an infection, so they can't get in. Now, here's the process of it. So we've got this fibrinogen, which is a soluble plasma protein. So it basically means it's dissolved in the plasma and it's a protein. When you get a cut, the platelets will activate the fibrinogen and convert it into fibrin which is insoluble. It forms a mesh and the red blood cells get trapped and that's how you get a blood clot. The final wee part is about the plasma. So this is the liquid part of the blood which acts as a transport medium. So its main job is to transport things around the body which are dissolved in the blood. The main the main things that are dissolved in it is food molecules. Be specific about this. It's glucose and amino acids. There's hormones such as insulin, testosterone, adrenaline, and the one you learned about last year, antidiuretic hormone or ADH. There's also carbon dioxide and there's urea. One thing which is not dissolved in plasma is oxygen and that is because it is carried by your red blood cells. 
Then finally, just this image, finally, just this image that you've got, just so you've got it labeled, plasma there, red blood cells are all over there, so there's tons of them. Then we've got this white blood cell, which is a lymphocyte. This white blood cell, which is a phagocyte. This is another cheeky little lymphocyte. And then, oh, I've just drawn lines through it, but there is a little platelet there. And that's us.